For hundreds of years, painters, then photographers, and finally filmmakers have sought ways to allow their illusions to break through the plane of the canvas or screen and make the experience more three-dimensional, more surrounding, more real. Virtual reality is a computer medium designed to give you the impression of being inside of an artificial world. It allows designers to construct worlds that people can visit and interact with as they please. Unfortunately, these two-dimensional images of virtual worlds are like those of a TV travelogue to some exotic land. Interesting, but it's just not the same thing as being there. With this in mind, Intel recently developed a virtual reality presentation in cooperation with the Guggenheim Museum in New York City. You know, it was a bit of an experiment, I mean, bringing virtual reality technology to the public in an art museum in New York City. We thought we had a good idea, but we weren't really sure how well it would be received. And we were like overwhelmed. We sold out every day. Over 250 editors came to see the show from magazines around the world. A dozen TV crews from around the world, Brazil, Europe, Australia, Japan, came, covered the exhibit. It was really a, a gratifying experience to see the public's response and their hunger for, for this exciting new way of using personal computers. While the exhibit demonstrated that virtual reality's value goes well beyond the arts, the advent of VR is especially significant in the context of art history. Remember, that one of the great thresholds crossed during the Renaissance was the development of linear perspective. This technique allowed artists to create paintings with a much greater sense of reality than ever before. It was one of the most stunning achievements of its time, impacting architecture, philosophy, war, and forever changing our perception of the world. Virtual reality is the crossing of the next threshold. With it, we are now able to step through the two-dimensional plane and into three-dimensional interactive worlds of our own invention. Most people are rather surprised to learn that this threshold was actually first crossed in the late 60s by Ivan Sutherland. Remember that this was a time when punch cards were considered the state of the art for most of us. While these efforts certainly illustrated new potential uses for computers, it took till the early 80s for the next step to occur. That's when NASA computer engineers were the first to begin putting the new technology into practical application. The software side includes the user application that describes the nature of a given world. Then there's the simulation manager and the 3D model database. On the other side are hardware components that include a graphics processor, a sound processor, and a device to accept input from external sensing devices such as helmet position sensors and joysticks. As you can see, VR integrates a number of functions that would be considered to be fairly sophisticated applications onto themselves. This illustrates the flow of information between the reality engine and its user. Obviously, there are many possibilities for input and output devices. Full immersion requires a special helmet not just because of how it can serve peripheral vision, but also for its ability to track head movement and supply three-dimensional sound. Various joysticks, wands, and gloves can be used to move around and manipulate objects in virtual space. As you might imagine, virtual reality requires fairly powerful computers. The advent of 486 and now Pentium processors has brought about a real blossoming of VR activity on personal computers. This presentation is really an opportunity to show how personal computers have crossed a, a threshold. They're now possible to do a whole new category of applications, graphical applications, whereby information goes from being zeros and ones and numbers on a page to a kind of new visual language. It's really an exciting breakthrough. For artists, it means involving the public in new kinds of experiences. Entertainers as well can now create dynamic, almost movies that you step into. For education, it's amazing. Children, adults, will be able to visit ancient Egypt or a Viking village and uh, participate in a historical simulation. Or they might be studying chemistry and being able to be down there and with the atoms as they molecularly evolve. 
This show focused on PC platform works by designers as divergent as musician Thomas Dolby, software designer Paul Marshall, artist Jenny Holzer, and educator Lynn Holden of Carnegie Mellon University. This one? This was the first thing that I did. It's a torus in which uh, you encounter a number of people, or cube heads as the case may be, and these cubes will either flee from you or will uh, let you catch them. And if you do manage to get one, uh, they will talk to you. It's just like real life. You can't tell what someone will say by what they look like. I was attracted to this new medium because I've been all along interested in doing works for a general public and this fits in very nicely uh, because this hopefully will be accessible to almost anyone. I made a desolate landscape in which there are a number of abandoned houses and when you enter these houses you will often hear a voice that will testify about what has occurred. The medium is in its infancy, and um, I certainly am new to it, but it's clear that it is moving forward at the speed of light, and I would like people not only to be hit, but to be hit with good stuff. My real interest in virtual reality came from conversations that I had with the Dean of the College of Fine Arts, Larry Burgess at Carnegie Mellon University, who was interested in the idea of using existing technologies in order to impact the dynamic interactions between students and teachers in uh, an educational environment such as a university, um, but also things that would allow uh, educators and students to take some of those experiences outside of the college campus. And we were really interested in pushing the edges to see if we could make available a rich amount of interdisciplinary information brought together around some of the critical people and events of the past times. I already had a background in archaeology and uh, Egyptology, so I had the visual materials, I had access to the um, academic content and was interested in using the computer to bring these into my own teaching experiences in the classroom, which ultimately led to the idea of offering a variety of experiences simultaneously to the student. And then we started trying to put these into the computer, anticipating the day when uh, learning environments will really become three-dimensional. So you'll be in a total surround immersive environment and you'll have access to places remote in time and space and when you get there you'll be able to interact with agents, guides, intelligent objects and so forth to recontextualize the knowledge. So if you're interested in a moment in ancient Egyptian history you can go to the place, see it the way it looks now as ruins, restore it the way it looked originally and bring objects that are displaced in many museums all around the world now but which originally were located in one place around one event and time back into their original context, you will be there with them and you will have experts or people that can illuminate or answer questions for you from a modern perspective and the ancient perspective. And obviously virtual reality is, uh, is the best way to do that. The metaphor mixer was meant to assist any kind of portfolio manager in the assessment of, of the information in the market that uh, nowadays is becoming very expansive. There's a, a huge amount of information available that uh, somebody who is investing in the market needs to be on top of if he's going to make a, a good investment decision. And um, what you see when you bring up the metaphor mixer is uh, you are essentially hovering above it. And it's been grouped out by industry groups and countries so that the intersection of a certain industry group and a country would be a, a square in this grid. And inside each quadrant is uh, a number of different chips, uh, each with a different shape, symbolizing a financial variable, in this case the market capitalization of the issue. Uh, these chips are hovering above the plane and, and below the plane. And the height that they're above or below is also color-coded so that a chip that's rising far above the plane and that's glowing blue uh, could be the percent change in price from yesterday. So a stock that's dropped significantly would be way below the plane uh, glowing red. 
So as you fly through this world, you're seeing uh, a much higher bandwidth of information than you normally would uh, if you were looking at, say, a, a matrix of numbers. And so what you're seeing is the, the, the patterns across industry groups, across various countries. Uh, you're able to see and isolate the anomalies and, and focus on the opportunity. Okay, what we've done now is we, we've just brought up our software agent. It has been programmed to isolate uh, certain characteristics out of a financial analytic system. And it will put down a tunnel of squares homing in on the particular issue that it has isolated as a particularly attractive uh, trading opportunity. Uh, the reason why the metaphor mixer was included in the Guggenheim was that it represents a different way of, of utilizing virtual reality technology. Instead of modeling real world objects and dynamics, it models uh, abstract ideas and concepts. Uh, the prices of the stock, the actual changing stock market prices are just something that's completely abstract. This uh, technique uh, makes uh, uh, mining and, and navigating through complex data and understanding it easy. Well, the Virtual String Quartet is a, a virtual reality representation of Mozart's 21st String Quartet in D major. Uh, the four musicians are computer generated and by putting on a head mounted display as we call it, uh, you will perceive yourself to be in the middle of these four musicians, two violins, a viola and a cello. In order to achieve this, when we recorded the Turtle Island String Quartet, we actually used a, a motion tracker to record their, their arm movements. Uh, and the computer-generated figures that you see in the Virtual String Quartet uh, will be replicating the movements that they, they made. And as I move around in this space, uh, the sound that I hear will correspond. So if you're playing the viola and I put my head next to you, what I'm going to hear is the viola. If I move back over here, I'm going to hear the cello. Or if I cross the room and look back on the four musicians, I'm going to hear the whole ensemble. Well, I feel that, that the uh, arcade game players and home computer fanatics, they're going to get VR anyway, but your grandmother isn't going to get it uh, unless we show her something that would appeal to her. And slaying pterodactyls is not going to appeal to your grandmother. However, a Mozart string quartet might. Um, so it's very enticing to me to be able to put a program like this at the disposal of the kind of people that go to the Guggenheim. Uh, they're a different cross-section. So the challenge to me was to provide content for them which would appeal to them. Intel's going to continue exploring new uses, new ways for the technology to grow. Equally, we'll be looking for creative ways like the exhibit with the Guggenheim to go out and communicate to the world the power of the personal computer. You're watching Sleepcore, Pleasant Dreams. i
今年6月横浜にオープンした新しいアミューズメントビルここの5階6階にはビルの主役となるアメリカ製のゲーム機が32台設置されることになっています。ゲーム業界の技術者の中にはよく高速道路を眺める人がいるといいます。ビデオゲームが登場する前技術者は機械式の装置を工夫してスピード感やスリル感を表していましたいわゆるエレメカと呼ばれるゲームですそして翌年田代さんはもう次の企画を考えていました車のコックピットから見た設定の本格的な 3D 画面この本格的な 3D 画面というのがどんな映像を意味しているのかそれは6年後の完成を待たなければなりませんし開かれているゲーム機の祭典アミューズメントマシンショーでは最近特に大型の体感マシンが幅を利かせていますグラフィックスの世界では日々画面のリアルさが向上していますしかしこうした美しい CG は1枚の画面を制作するのに数時間もかかることが少なくありません美しければ時間とコストがかかるこれが CG の世界の常識ですゲーム業界ももちろん CG に憧れを持っていますしかしゲームの場合はプレイヤーが運転したりミサイルを撃ったりするのに反応してリアルタイムで画面を動かさなくてはなりません美しさよりもいかに早く動かせるかが勝負になるのですゆうちゃんさ、はいはい、ピッチングのループゲインがさローリングよりもさ低い現在各ゲームメーカーが開発にしのぎを削っているのはポリゴン CG というグラフィックスですこの開発中のマシンでも今ポリゴン CG で画面を作っているところですポリゴンとは三次元座標の上に成り立つ平面体のことですこの正方形も三次元の中に存在しているので座標軸を変えれば角度も大きさも自由に変化させることができますまたいくつものポリゴンを組み合わせることによって複雑な立体物を描くこともできますもちろんこの立体物も
角度や大きさを自由に変えることができますこうして描かれたものはコンピューターの空間の中で私たちの現実と同じように三次元的に存在しているのです。この宇宙空母は約四百五十枚のポリゴンを組み合わせて作られています。これもそれぞれの座標点を変更するだけで大きさを変えたり動かすことが簡単に行えるのです。ポリゴンを使うことにより広い空間を作り出すことも容易になりました。ポリゴンを組み合わせ都市を作る三次元の世界なので。そこにはもう空間が存在しますその空間を見る視点を変化させることによってその中を自由に動いているような感覚が得られるのですこれがバーチャルリアリティの第一歩ですなく市場に出るポリゴン CG のドライブゲームバーチャーレーシングです You're watching Sleepcore Media for Insomnia I'm John Forbes, AutoCAD product manager here at Autodesk. Since the earliest days of civilization, a few highly talented, motivated men and women have led the way in discovering new technologies that have dramatically changed the way people live their lives. The discovery of fire, the printing press, the light bulb, the transistor, all these are examples of new technologies that have dramatically changed society forever. Some people feel that a highly talented team of research scientists here at Autodesk are on the verge of making just such an important discovery. A discovery that will change the way people live, work, and play. A discovery that will open up an entirely new world, never before explored by man. So come with us today and join us in exploring this new world, the world of cyber. To help us understand the computer technology that makes cyberspace possible, let's take a quick look at the history of the technology of computer graphics. A man actually talking to a computer in a way far different than it's ever been possible to do before. Surely not with his voice. No, he's going to be talking graphically. He's going to be drawing, and the computer is going to understand his drawings. And the man will be using a language, a graphical language that we call Sketchpad, that started with Ivan Sutherland some years ago when he was busy working on his doctoral degree. The MIT graduate student who developed Sketchpad in 1963 had this in mind when he set out to create an alternative to batch input of letters and numbers via punch cards or keyboards using the now familiar light pen and function keys. One of Sutherland's goals was to take better advantage of the natural human talent for eye-hand brain. Three-dimensional interface environments are a much tougher nut to crack. Few current systems go that far beyond the basic vocabulary pioneered by Sutherland. One of the missing ingredients all these years has been a really good three-dimensional interactive device. Some new products, though, appear to overcome previous deficiencies. The space ball from Spatial Data Systems is one such product. It is impressively intuitive and simple to use. The user simply grasps the space ball in either hand and pushes, pulls, lifts or twists it slightly to control translation or rotation in all directions. The harder you push or twist, the faster the graphics display reacts. The ball is made of firm rubber and doesn't actually move. 
Inside is an analog sensor that detects the torques and pressures exerted on the ball. This information is sent to the analog digital converter housed in the base of the unit, which then connects to the workstation. In this case, a Sun 3 260 CXP. Another breakthrough device is the data glove from VPL Research, a lightweight glove that senses hand gesture, position, and orientation. Instead of bringing the hand to a heavy control device that typically sits on a table, the data glove puts a lightweight device on the hand and then keeps track of where the hand is using a built-in position sensor. Fiber optic threads sandwiched between the layers of the glove sense bending and extension of the fingers or spreading of the hand. The glove feeds all these sensor parameters to a control unit that can output calibrated records, making it possible to build an individualized gesture library for higher level commands. A team in the Human Factors Research Division at NASA's Ames Research Center has combined the data glove with a speech recognition device and head position sensors. Together, they control a head-mounted display system to create a multi-purpose virtual interface environment. The head-mounted display unit uses two liquid crystal display screens presented to each eye of the user through wide-angle optics. Each eye has a 120-degree field of view, both horizontally and vertically, with a common binocular field of up to 90 degrees that allows natural parallax depth perception using stereoscopic images. The imagery appears to completely surround the user in three space. The operator can explore and interact with the virtual environment just as if they were touching real objects in real time and from multiple viewpoints. Possible applications include long distance control of robots and monitoring or management of large scale integrated information systems such as might be found in future space stations. Virtual interface environments and head mounted displays have been researched for more than 20 years by a variety of people ranging from Ivan Sutherland to Nicholas Negroponte. The NASA system is significant because of its skillful use of the latest hardware to fit the interactive graphics system onto the human body in an unusually comfortable and unobtrusive manner. The concept of cyberspace, creating realities on the other side of computer screens, opens up a new and very thrilling chapter in uh, the human adventure. For thousands of years, intelligent men and women have known that there lies within, somewhere in our brains, a, a universe of, of wonder and of novelty and innovation and creativity. This can be accessed, booted up, turned on, activated by skillful yogis or people lucky enough to be in a place where they know how to do this. But for thousands of years, no one has been able to express or describe these wonders within. Typically, people came back from exploring their brains saying, wow, just the, the expression of wonder and surprise. Occasionally, brilliant artists like Hieronymus Bosch have come back and have put on canvas a little picture or a still frame of uh, this wonderful series of universes within. But now in the late 20th century, at, uh, here at Autodesk, uh, a band of explorers has assembled and given us the hardware and the software to allow us to go beyond and through the screen and to inhabit, to move around in uh, the cybernetic universe. But the best ways to describe this most homely terms is it's like an aquarium. When you look at a, a boob tube or put your nose against a computer screen, you're looking at a digital universe there. In the past, all we could do is look at it or perhaps change dials. Now, with the cyber space techniques, we can go on the other side of the screen and swim around in this aquarium of meeting and meet other people there and, and uh, computer-aided design of reality. Now, there are many words currently used to describe this ability to to create new universes. We talk about virtual reality or artificial reality. Our prophet William Gibson has described the digital matrix, the consensual hallucination of all human knowledge. Here at this is called cyberspace, and uh, it's a nice place to be. Now, let's take a look at the development of cyberspace at the Autodesk Research Lab. The Autodesk Cyberspace Research Lab. In a moment, I'd like to take you on a tour of an AutoCAD architectural model but a tour rather different from any you've probably had before. You see, people are used to dealing with computers, looking at them through screens, where it's impossible to get through the screen into what's on the other side. But using cyberspace techniques and some interface devices that I'll show you in a moment, 
it's possible to literally immerse yourself inside the virtual world of the computer. Now, to do this, we do need to use some special equipment. And one item of this computerized apparel is what you see on my hand here. This is a data glove with a magnetic Palhima sensor on the back that lets the computer track the position and orientation of my hand at all times. And these optical fibers that let the computer sense what gesture my hand is in. You see, in cyberspace, the computer renders a picture of parts of your body as well. So as well as having images of architectural things, you yourself are part of the world. Senator? Yes, reason, my lord. The maiden you court is, uh, well, you sell short your exalted position. I am beyond reason, gentle senator. 
I am dying. Dying? Are you ill, your greatness? Oh, most gravely, dear senator, and I fear it will be the end of me. By Isis, I shall call a physician. It would be to no avail. Not even Hippocrates could help me. Gentle senator, my illness is incurable by man. It shakes the very foundation of my being and clouds my thoughts, rumbling in my loins. Is it gas, sire? Ow! 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 No. I'm sorry. Piercing in the belt of the Egyptian darkness of my heart and makes wrenching, twisted agony of my every waking hour.